After watching this lecture, you should be able to describe the hypothalamic pituitary axes and apply feedback control principles to predict levels of hormones when there's a disturbance in a given feedback loop. Let's take a look at the anatomy and recall that there are five major anterior pituitary cell types and they're controlled by these hypothalamic hormones that are sent down this specialized portal system. You can see here that there are four blue colored releasing neurons that have releasing hormones that are sent down this system as well as two magenta colored inhibitory neurons that release inhibitory uh, hormones that are sent down as well. In general the cell types are under dominant releasing control with the exception of the lactotrophs which are controlled by dopamine. If we go and look at specifically those cell types you can see they're listed here and here are the blue releasing hormones and the two inhibitory hormones and you can see with the exception of the lactotrophs the dominant control is through these releasing hormones and end in RH and the output from these cells then are going to be stimulated by the corticotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone, or thyrotropin releasing hormone. Now we're going to focus on systems that the target of the anterior pituitary hormone is an endocrine gland, one of the major endocrine glands. And you can see that adrenocorticotropin hormone, its target is the adrenal cortex, the gonadotropins target are the gonads and TSH its target is the thyroid gland and those are going to be the three major systems that we're going to discuss you certainly can draw feedback loops involving growth hormone and prolactin but that will be done in another section so if we go back to our schematic the three major elements of a hypothalamic pituitary axis is the hypothalamus and here it's blue because we're only going to be focusing on the releasing hormones we're going to ignore inhibitory hormones for this discussion and we have the anterior pituitary cell type in green just like the anatomy picture that had uh, the troph cells and then we have the endocrine gland in yellow which would be either the adrenal cortex the gonads or the thyroid gland let's take a look at what those are specifically and this is what it, this is what it would look like we have our hypothalami up here, the releasing hormones coming out, CRH, GNRH, and TRH. It's a plus because when these hormones go up, the output of the gonadotrophs, corticotrophs, and thyrotrophs goes up. Or, on the other hand, if the levels of these hormones went down, the output would go down. So it's, it's a positive relationship. Now, the output of these corticotrophs gonadotrophs and thyrotrophs are these tropin hormones ACTH, gonadotropins and TSH and the, and the receptors for those hormones are on these major endocrine organs, the adrenal cortex, the gonads and the thyroid. You can see there's a plus here and a plus there and a plus there because when the output of ACTH, gonadotropins and TSH goes up the output from the endocrine glands goes up as well and it also works for the flip side when these levels go down the output from the endocrine gland goes down now what makes these negative feedback loops is that the end product of these glands comes back and inhibits hypothalamic and anterior pituitary output so that stabilizes the levels of these hormones so they don't go out of control and what we want to do is think about if there is a disturbance in these systems what would the levels of the hormones be and what we're gonna focus on for that is the case of endocrine disorders involving deficiency states or excess states now you see here we don't have hypothalamic hormones listed because they can't be measured that easily in the blood. They're such small concentration. Remember, they're released into that portal system. They reach very high concentrations to their targets in the anterior pituitary, but you can't really measure them in the blood. So we're going to leave those, those out, although you can theoretically think about what those would do. So the two major problems are deficiency and excess states. And if we start with a problem in the endocrine gland itself, let's say we, we consider destruction of uh, 
endocrine gland. And this is not an uncommon scenario. Autoimmune destruction of an endocrine gland is, is pretty common cause of deficiency states. What we'd want to do is we'd want to start with where the problem is. So if we go back to our situation here, if any of these organs are damaged, the output from them is going to go down. That would be the first place you'd want to start. But because of lack of negative feedback, the anterior pituitary hormones would be going up. And despite the levels of those being high, the output from these cells would be still low because the problem is that they were destroyed in the first place or damaged in the first place. So if we can go back to our table, of course we'd have low levels of the endocrine hormone here and high levels of the anterior pituitary hormone. Now we could have destruction of the anterior pituitary cell. I'm just going to call that ant pituitary cell. And in that case, we'd start with the anterior pituitary hormone being low. And as a consequence, the endocrine hormone coming out from those glands would be low. So in both of these scenarios, we have a deficiency state. The patient would experience symptoms of low levels of hormone, either that, that could be sex steroids could be low, thyroid hormone could be low, cortisol could be low. Okay, But we wouldn't be able to figure out what the source of the problem was that easily unless we um, had the anterior pituitary hormone level. So this is very critical to have both of these to really figure out where the problem could be. Now we also can have tumors that producing excess hormone. That's not the only cause of excess, but it, it, it's a common one. And if we had an endocrine gland tumor, well, I'm just going to call it endocrine tumor, we'd start with the endocrine hormone being high, okay, and if we go and look at the feedback loop here, if the problem was a tumor of the adrenal cortex or the gonads of the thyroid, the problem is that th these cells are making the hormone uncontrollably and are then going to suppress the anterior pituitary. Now, despite the anterior pituitary hormones being low, the output's still going to be high because the problem was there in the first place. So we can go back and think about what that's going to look like. And so this is going to be low because it's going to be suppressed by the high level of hormone. And even though this is low, the endocrine tumor level, uh, the hormone from the endocrine tumor are going to be high because that's where the problem lies. Now, we also can have an anterior pituitary tumor. And in that case, the problem would start in the anterior pituitary, so it would be high. And because the levels of the anterior pituitary hormone are high, that's going to cause the output from the endocrine organ to be high. And so in both of these cases, you can see we have excess either cortisol or thyroid hormone or sex steroids. But again, we really don't know what the cause is unless we look at these anterior pituitary hormones. So you can see it's very important to have an idea what these are doing to know what the cause is. This is done all the time. If a patient comes in with a thyroid problem, thyroid hormones being too low, we don't know if it's a problem with the thyroid gland or a problem with the anterior pituitary cell type, thyrotroph. And if we measure TSH, we can really figure out what that would be. If TSH was high, we would say, well, it's a problem with the thyroid gland. If TSH was low, then it would be a problem with the anterior pituitary thyrotroph output. So again, this is very important. And you can see that if you know all of the hormone cell, cell types in the anterior pituitary, what the hormone names are, Okay, and what their targets are, you can figure out these sorts of problems. So it's very important to consider these feedback loops when thinking about a disturbance in a hypothalamic pituitary axis. So now that we've completed this discussion, you should be able to predict changes in hormone levels if you're given a new feedback loop, and certainly one of these three that we've gone over, including the corticotrophs, gonadotrophs, and thyrotrophs. And I encourage you to think about what would the feedback loop look like for the control of prolactin or even growth hormone. 
Um, it's a very similar concept. It's just some of the arrows and signs are a little different. And that concludes this lecture on hypothalamic pituitary axes and feedback control.